we begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and ask that you would fill our hearts with the light and the power of your word. Lead us as we prepare to hear your word and to receive your sacrament, to confess our sins, and then also to rejoice in your promise of salvation. Re having received your word of truth and your promise of forgiveness, move us to love as you have loved us and to live as you would have us live to the glory of your holy name. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. rise. This morning we'll be following the order of service on page 12 and following in the worship supplement. This morning as we come to the 19th Sunday after Trinity, we reflect on the work and the privilege that God has given to us to serve others in his name. And he motivates us to carry that work out by his great and enduring love for us. We begin our worship service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and to serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserved only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give us the strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty and most merciful God, because you are so good, please keep us from all physical and spiritual dangers and equip us both in body and in soul to do your will cheerfully. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our opening reading for this weekend is found recorded for us in Matthew chapter, oh, I'm sorry, in 1st 2nd Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. These verses, the Apostle Paul, as he nears the end of this epistle, describes the importance of serving the Lord by serving our neighbor. We read from 2nd Thessalonians chapter 3. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. In our gospel reading from Matthew chapter 12, we have another example of work. And this comes to us in the disciples as they reaped from the fields on the Sabbath day. We're going to have the example of the Pharisees who criticized them for that and how Jesus then responds to them. We read from Matthew chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. 
But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? that they might accuse him. Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored as whole as the other. Here ends our gospel reading. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and treasure it. Alleluia. Please rise. This morning we'll be joining in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 5 to confess our faith. The Nicene Creed on page 5. In this creed we confess our faith in that triune God who has redeemed us that we might work for him and look forward to the hope that is ours in eternal life. We join to confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 540 as we're reminded of the privilege of serving God and working for Him during our time here on earth. Hymn 540.
You may remain seated this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God which we are considering this morning is found recorded for us in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 18. We're continuing on through our study of the Old Testament and in particular the ministry of Elijah. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mehalah, you shall anoint as a prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is the word of our God. In the name of our Savior Jesus, the one who has redeemed us from sin and who has given us purpose in this life, dear fellow redeemed, 7,000 individuals. It wasn't a large number in the big scheme of things. Not when you compared 7,000 to the millions of inhabitants of Israel and Judah. 7,000 people in comparison to such a large number. The true God was on the bargain rack 
He was being sold for cheap. The people of Israel could care little for God, the true God of Israel. They preferred the ugly God of the nations around, the God Baal, a God who fit with their flesh, their desires, who allowed them to do the things that they wanted to do. The God of Israel, nobody listened to him anymore. These are the times in which our text took place. If we think about that example, we realize when we look at the culture around us today that it isn't any different today. Just as in the days of Elijah, when we look at our world today and we take a look at how human beings are following the desires of their own heart, the lusts and the desires that are on the inside, we can see it everywhere around us. We can see it in advertisements. We can hear it on the radio. It even comes into our own homes with TV and social media. It is quite evident that when we think that people should be turning to God, pouring into his church in large numbers, we see just the opposite. Instead, people are turning away from the one true God. They're turning away to the false desires of the world and to their own heart. Just like in the days of Elijah, the truth of God is being set aside for the sake of political correctness in our society even by those who outwardly profess Christ as their Savior. It's sad times. Only 7,000 people. Like Elijah, we too who live in similar times may also become discouraged by the situation that surrounds us. And if you are discouraged by the situation in which we live, by the state of what appears to be Christianity in our world today, then the words of our text are for you. Because here in the verses of our text, God comes to a discouraged follower. And he comes to that discouraged follower with two things. First of all, he reminds us not to focus on the visible results of the work that the Lord has entrusted to us. And finally, he reminds us that in spite of what might look like going, what is going on around us, God is still in control. We pray that the Spirit would bless our study of these verses here this morning. Amen. It's an important question that the Lord asks in the verses of our text. What are you doing here, Elijah? It helps a little bit if we have some geography lessons. Israel was way up here in the north. This is where Elijah lived and where he was called to minister. But what Elijah had done is he had left that region of Israel where he was supposed to be ministering, and he had gone south to the region of Judah. But he didn't stop there. He continued going further south into the Sinai Peninsula all the way down to Mount Sinai called Mount Horeb in the verses of our text. In other words, he was running away. What are you doing here, Elijah? The Lord asks this question twice in the verses of our text. He is currently many, many miles away from the work that the Lord had given to him. He was certainly in a memorable spot, the spot where the Lord had brought the children of Israel centuries earlier, where he had given the Ten Commandments. The only problem was Israel wasn't there now. Israel was back where the Lord had called him to be. The only one here at Mount Horeb was Elijah. What excuse does Elijah offer for being out here in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness? Elijah says in our text, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. If you look at those words, it all adds up to one thing. In Elijah's mind, his life could be summarized in one word, failure. Elijah stood with a long 
and very important reputation that had gone before him. Almost superhuman faithfulness to the Lord. If we look at the life of Elijah, it's simply amazing. When he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, that was an understatement of understatements. Elijah had stood up against wicked King Ahab and his even more wicked Queen Jezebel. He had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and the many false prophets that they had brought into the land, and he had been an advocate for the one true God. An amazing feat for this man of God. As we look at the ministry of Elijah, we see that he had no fear. He stood up against these individuals going through the land like a tornado, a one-man army against false gods and idolatry and the wicked kings and queens of that nation. And yet, they sought to kill Elijah, and still nothing could stop him. Just before the verses of our text, Elijah had called all of Israel out to Mount Carmel. He said, we're going to have a contest. Once and for all, we're going to determine who the true God is. So the false prophets of Baal gathered together, 450 of them. They set up an altar. They called out to their God while Elijah builds an altar to the true God. All day long, the prophets of Baal called out to God, to their God, hearing nothing. No response. Finally, Elijah calls out to the one true God, and he says, whoever answers with fire from heaven, then we will know who the true God is. And when Elijah prayed, fire came down from heaven, consuming the, not only the offering, but the altar and everything there. Do you remember the response of the people? The Lord is God. The Lord is God. We know it. In Elijah's mind, that was the turning point that needed to take place. Now the people knew. It would change everything. And yet, less than a month later, Elijah wakes up, and we heard in the verses of our text, Queen Jezebel's promise. Remember, they took the false prophets down, and they killed the false prophets for blasphemy, for idolatry. And, and Jezebel says, give me 24 hours. If you aren't dead in 24 hours, then... I could be dead too. And so that's when finally Elijah fled. He fled for fear of his life. He went south into Judah and kept on going, running away. What was his complaint? The children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and I alone am left. Elijah expected big results after that showdown at Mount Carmel, and yet what he expected didn't come to fruition in the way that he desired. The people didn't come back to learn more about the true God. Instead, Queen Jezebel made it her single purpose in life to remove Elijah from the face of this earth. When Elijah ran for his life, he flees to Sinai. It's here that the Lord comes to Elijah and reminds him that it's not about visible results. It's not about the expectations that we put on the ministry that the Lord has given to us. Elijah looked at his ministry and it seemed like he had very little to show for it. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, the Lord replied, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. It wasn't a huge number when compared to the millions of people in Israel, but it was a whole lot more than Elijah thought was there. I alone am left, Elijah said. The Lord reminds Elijah in his discouragement, in his disappointment, as he thought that his ministry for the Lord was a failure, that it wasn't. That the Lord had indeed worked through the ministry of Elijah, and he had reserved 7,000 people in Israel who had not worshipped the false god of Baal. The words of the prophet Isaiah ring true. My word will not return to me void. It will accomplish what I please. It will prosper in the thing for which I send it, the Lord promises. Even when we don't see the visible results that we want to see. 
At the same time, the Lord also reminds Elijah that he's still in control. The results might not be visible to us, but we need to be reminded that in spite of what we see going on around us, God promises that he is still in control. When the Lord hears Elijah's response, the Lord replies to Elijah. He says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Elijah's life had been in danger many times prior to this event. And yet he had remained faithful in the work that the Lord had given to him. He had trusted in the Lord's preservation. We heard about that a number of weeks ago where the Lord provided food for him through the ravens and water at the brook Cherith, sent him on up to the widow of Zarephath where again he provided miraculously for Elijah. In those cases, the Lord led Elijah out of that situation. But in this case, the Lord says, I want you in Israel. That's where you need to be. That's where the work is that needs to be done. Yes, Jehovah demonstrates his power to Elijah. The Lord, he has control over all things. He could have used his power in the form of a tornado, a fire, or an earthquake as he had in previous times in biblical history. He could have sent fire down from heaven as he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. He could have opened up the earth as he did with Korah and the rebellion against Moses. He could have sent a wind that parted the waters as he did with the Red Sea for his people. But the Lord doesn't always work that way. It is the still small voice of the Lord that is the most powerful thing of all. The Lord could use those means with his own people, but those situations were all periods of judgment. Judgment over Sodom and Gomorrah, judgment over the Egyptian army, judgment over Korah and his men. The Lord still desired the redemption and salvation of his people, Israel. The Lord says to Elijah, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. You shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. You shall anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Mehulah, and him you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. What does the Lord do? He directs Elisha or Elijah to the future, to those who would pick up the work after Elijah was gone, being reminded that the Lord not only was in control, but he would continue to be in control and he would work through others whom he would raise up to fill the place, the role, the shoes of Elijah in the future. Hazael would be an individual that the Lord would use to bring judgment on his people Israel in the future. He would use Jehu, the next king, in order to bring judgment upon Ahab and his family. And he would use Elisha in order to lead the people to repentance and to trust in the one true God. Yes, God would punish those who turned away from him. But here and now, he was using Elijah to give his people another opportunity to know him as the one and only God. The Lord would bring those things to pass in his good and perfect time. This section is a wonderful reminder of the law and the gospel and how important those two doctrines of scripture are. That while the law does come to us and it does very clearly point out the problem of our sin and our failure when it comes to God, 
it also brings to us that pure message of comfort and hope in the fact that God desires our salvation. And he sends us out in order to bring that message of salvation to those around us. If you're discouraged by the state of the world, by the state of Christianity in our own country, hear the words that the Lord gives to Elijah. Take heart. Be reminded of what the Lord assures Elijah and each one of us. We can't always look forward to visible results. But we know that the Lord is working through the message of his law and gospel to bring hearts to a knowledge of their sin and to repentance, trusting in Jesus as their Savior. And in spite of what it might look like in the world around us, we know to be certain that God is in control, that he will use the ministry that he has given to each one of us as individuals, and that when he's ready to take us home, he will raise somebody else up to follow us in that ministry, to continue on the work of the gospel until finally Jesus returns on that great and glorious day. This message is a message that God gives to his discouraged followers, that we might know that he is indeed at work, that we can thank him for his power, but also for that still, small voice that points us to the assurance of God's love for each one of us, a message that we are privileged to proclaim. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you who are always with us, never leaving or forsaking us, we praise and glorify you for the mercy which you have shown to us in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who came to remove our sins by sacrificing himself on the cross. We thank you for showing your eternal love to us in this way by delivering us from the power of sin and death and opening the gate of heaven for us. As we reflect on this truth, we confess that we are unworthy of your love. We have disobeyed your will and your word more than we even know. Oh Lord, we ask that you would turn us from our evil ways and create in us a faith that we might put our complete confidence only in the merit of Christ. Pardon our sins through Christ's word of forgiveness and help us to cast all of our iniquity upon you, knowing that he has buried it in the depths of the sea. Fill your church with your Holy Spirit, that we might have the power, the knowledge, and the wisdom that are above any human ingenuity and intellect. Give to our pastors, teachers, and missionaries faithful hearts, courage, and zeal for your word, that more and more people might be built up in faith and love and finally enter your glory in eternity. Well, Lord, we also pray for our country. We ask that you would give us civil servants who are worthy of honor, leaders in business and labor who are unselfish and farsighted, and those who are guided by the public good and respect for their fellow citizens. Grant your grace upon each one of our homes, that in each one there will be examples of Christian love and character that will build up the faith of all those who live there and provide a foretaste of the joy and the blessedness of our home in heaven. 
We plead for your care of those who are sick or suffering in any way. Teach them to turn to you and to wait patiently for your mercy. Grant unto them hope and joyful deliverance from each one of their trials, letting them walk in the light of your word every day of their life. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our refuge and hope, in whose name we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated.